So a judge ruled on Friday that a ban on experimental surgery for minors and hormonal abuse can take effect. Now, if you read the press, it says, oh, it's a ban on gender affirming health care. And it sounds like these poor kids are being denied basic health care. But that's if you conflate what health care is to what we're actually talking about. And they're entirely two different things. Not It has nothing to do with informed consent either. And, of course, this is down to the hard work and fighting spirit of Missouri's AG, Andrew Bailey, who joins us via Skype. Good to see you, sir. Congrats on this victory because this is huge. And I think this is, I read an editorial and I was trying to find it. Uh, someone said that this is really kind of one of the uh, one of the bigger shots across the bow of this, this it, it, it grab towards kids and this experimental surgery. Yeah, huge win in the fight to protect children here in Missouri, but also in the entire nation. I mean, I think the mood nationally is changing on this issue, and a lot of it is because uh, warriors in this space are shining the light of truth on the lies of the left, just as you're doing. I mean, th there ain't no health care about it. Don't yeah. let them call it gender affirming health care. This is nothing more than sterilization of children, gender mutilation in, in, in pursuit of a woke left wing ideology. There's no medicine or science to back it up. And that's why it was so important for us to go to court put on the evidence, make their experts own the fact under cross-examination that the studies they're relying on are based on weak science, that they ignore the studies coming out of Europe showing that these are dangerous procedures. The pills are dangerous. The drugs are dangerous. The surgery is irreversible and has long-term negative health consequences. Make them own that on, under cross-examination for the entire world to see. And that's part of the winning strategy we were able to put together to deliver this win to protect kids. That's one of the, the interesting things. There were several that came out of this case, too, because, you know, everyone, uh, you know, I think a lot of the American left really idolizes how Europe does things. But Europe doesn't. This is not something that they go. They don't get into the horror hormonal abuse. They don't get into the experimental surgery and, and demand that people provide this as, as the left is trying to do here at taxpayer expense. Very different. And that came out in court. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, being able to expose that through the, the process of, uh, you know, the, the rules of evidence of the judicial process was really important. That's really part of the winning litigation strategy. We were able to partner with like-minded state attorneys general, many of whom have uh, their states have passed bills similar to Missouri's SB 49 in their states previously. And these attorneys general have had to defend those bills. And so, you know, we we're able to take lessons learned, what worked, what didn't, what would you have done differently, what would you have done the same, and weave all of that together into a winning litigation strategy that involved cross-examining the other side's experts, but also putting on our own evidence. Hmm. So for instance, we put on our own expert who testified that, you know, the entire medical health association is, is treating gender dysphoria differently than any other diagnosable ailment in the, in the DSM-5, any other mental health condition, you wouldn't race towards hormonal treatments. You would use psychology and psychiatry. So why would we be using uh, hormonal treatments here and doing this differently when there's no medicine or science to back it up? Uh, uh, completely true. Talking with Missouri attorney general, Andrew Bailey, this huge uh, court victory. And, and it was interesting too. I was reading the judge, I mean, essentially said, you know, that there was there was no demonstrated or at least the, you know, the opposition here, the people who really wanted this, they wanted the ban to go away. They didn't they weren't actually successful in showing how this was some kind of uh, compromise of a constitutional right. They didn't show the success on, you know, they were trying to challenge the law on this, but they were not showing that they had a constitutional constitutional basis to do so. I mean, I don't even know how. They could try to argue that this is somehow denying someone something, especially when it's a minor. And especially when, as we talked before last week, there's no long term anything to show that this is I mean, you're, you're creating a situation where you need perpetual health care. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's more dangerous to the patients than than helpful. And certainly our expert opined as to that. Our expert said that in instances where uh, g uh, youth with gender dysphoria are, are treated with uh, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, they're actually more suicidal, more likely to commit suicide. So it's not helping kids, it's harming kids. Uh, I would also point out that, to your point though, yeah, the plaintiffs, the ACLU and Lambda Legal, want the court to find that there's an equal protection right to sterilize kids. That doesn't make any sense. It flies in the face of the text history and tradition of the Constitution and 100 years of uh, equal protection clause jurisprudence. So again, huge win. You know, I think this creates a blueprint. We've drawn up a winning play for other states uh, to use in the future and are happy to pass that on to uh, states that either are waiting in the wings to pass bills similar to Missouri's SB 49 or state attorneys general who are about to go into court to defend their state's law. First state in the nation to successfully fight back against a preliminary injunction at the trial court level on this very issue. And I would see, I, I would think a lot of other states, as you said, I'm so glad you're you're sharing the blueprint for that because really this is ultimately, I think, the way to to wage the battle on this is state by state through the AGs.
Yeah, and you know, again, some of the evidence we put on, I think, was really compelling. Yeah. Uh, for instance, Jeannie Reed, the whistleblower from yeah. the clinic in St. Louis, testified. Now, this is a woman who I've said all along has, has a lot of reason to be trusted, has a lot of credibility in what she's saying, because look at her motive. She's someone who self-describes as a progressive who believes in transgender rights and was willing to put her name on a sworn affidavit and subject herself to penalty of perjury, but also was willing to come to court and testify under oath and be cross-examined by the plaintiffs. It's a and so. Witness. It's a powerful witness, detransitioners as well, victims of this system who are willing to come in and, and be courageous enough to share their stories as a war warning of caution, uh, you know, and how they're serving life sentences uh, because of the, how they were victimized by this system. And again, that's powerful and potent uh, information that gets into the public domain. We put it all out there in open court. The judge listened to it. The audience had a stunned reaction and the media can't hide from it. Yeah. Uh, uh, one last quick thing on this, uh, because you made up, a, you brought up a very good point here when you were talking about the detransitioners. Media always runs to you know the youth that say oh i want to go through this i want to i i'm trans i want to transition but then when they have like a change of heart or as they mature and they realize oh my gosh what i did really wasn't informed and they change their minds and there have been a, a number of these detransitioners who have done so that were media darlings five years ago and now they can't get an interview anywhere to talk about the horror reality of this uh, i mean they they set themselves up for a lifetime the way that i've read every single one without exception a lifetime of pain a lifetime of prescription prescription medication. Uh, they are horribly uncomfortable. They're dealing, still dealing with this and they might have to have more surgery in the future. And I, you know, this might be kind of rhetorical, but I mean, you found that as well with all the witnesses that you brought up. There was not one without exception that's not going to have to live a life of pain or a constant, you know, a medicinal regimen as a result of this. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Certainly that's consistent with the, with what the experts have told us. That's what consistent with what's been coming out of the studies in Europe, far to the left of America culturally that have curtailed these procedures. And unfortunately, that's what the victims, uh, the detransitioners that we called to testify, stated in open court. And again, powerful evidence, powerful testimony, compelling. Yeah. The court in paragraph 10 of its order said there was no medicine or science. Uh, there was no consensus on the medicine or science and the evidence created more questions than answers. Thus, there can be no consensus on the standard of care. This isn't healthcare. It's woke left-wing quackery masquerading as medicine. And we got to call it out and shine the light of truth on it. There you go. Right there, Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey. Appreciate your fight on behalf of our kids. Thank you so much for this. And thanks for sharing the blueprint on it too. Other AGs should follow your pattern here. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. Of course. Good to see you.